Hey, you're listening to MIGS Front Page with Peter Movilla. Today we'll be discussing the paper entitled Risk Reducing Bilateral Salpingo Oropharectomy, Assessing the Incidence of Occult Ovarian Cancer and Surgeon Adherence to Recommended Practices. In this paper, 269 procedures of the risk reducing bilateral salpingo oropharectomy were examined by a practitioner either being a benign gynecologist or a surgical oncologist. And it was discovered that some of the recommended practices were not routinely being followed by benign gynecologists. We're lucky to have with us today the first author, Dr. Laura Newcomb of the University of Pittsburgh. Welcome, Dr. Laura Newcomb. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. This is a really exciting opportunity. Thanks. Well, I really enjoyed uh, reading your recent publication uh, discussing risk-reducing uh, bilateral salping war correctly. I wanted to just jump into and ask you, what was your motivation for even performing this study? Yeah, so I've always said that there's value in training at different institutions along your career path. And this study is a good example of why. So I was having a discussion with one of my MIGS attendings here at McGee um, about a risk-reducing BSO procedure that we were just about to perform. And I was saying, you know, where I did my residency, only oncologists ever did this procedure. And the thought behind that was that if a malignancy was unanticipated and encountered at the time of the risk-reducing BSO, then they could just go right ahead and proceed with staging. But as you know, there is not only one right way to do things. At McGee, things are a little more progressive in that uh, benign gynecologists are routinely performing these procedures with oncology just down the OR hall in case they're needed. So we wondered how often are malignancies really being diagnosed in this population. The literature, you know, reports a wide range, anywhere from 2 to 10 percent, but that comes mostly from small cohorts and wasn't reflecting sort of more recent techniques for detection of early tubal cancers. And so we also wondered, are oncologists doing anything differently during these procedures? Are they following guidelines better? How are the generalists doing at following guidelines? But I think overall, for MIGS, this is a good opportunity for us to perform procedures that the oncologists don't need to be doing. Um, You know, they're busy enough with the amount of cancer cases that they have, and they don't need to be doing these low-risk procedures as well. And if we can properly educate the benign surgeons on the recommendations for performing a risk-reducing BSO, we could have an impact by making this procedure more accessible for those who don't have access to an oncologist and hopefully having this procedure performed in a more timely manner and not waiting too long. You know, for those of us who might encounter a BRCA genetic mutation carrier in one of our clinics, just generally speaking, what are some, I guess, standard or recommended gynecologic practices uh, to come kind of counsel a patient such as that on? Good question. So there's really two things that have been proven to decrease ovarian cancer-specific mortality in patients with BRCA mutations, one of which is performing a risk-reducing BSO. For BRCA1 carriers, uh, both ACOG and SGO recommends that it be performed between ages 35 and 40. And for BRCA2 carriers, it's recommended to be performed between 40 and 45 or when childbearing is complete. And the second thing is oral contraceptive use, uh, which we all know decreases the risk of development of ovarian cancer. However, beyond that, unfortunately, the data doesn't really support screening with things like, say, 125 or a transvaginal ultrasound. Um, And as we all are familiar, this lack of an effective screening tool is what often leads to many women's late diagnosis of ovarian cancer. Um, But the studies just don't show an impact on these tests on the outcomes. However, uh, you know, that being said, many providers still obtain these studies. Um, Some of that may be driven by patient preference or provider comfort, but you have to be somewhat careful and remember that these tests are not perfect. Uh, And we saw that in this study. So five of the eight patients that were diagnosed with cancer had a normal CA-125. And of the ones who had imaging, all of it was normal. Um, And on on the flip side, CA-125 also can be elevated by common diseases like endometriosis. So we have to keep that in mind in this population of premenopausal patients that are having this procedure performed. What are some of the surgical steps that should be commonly practiced when you are performing a risk-reducing BSO? The recommended procedures, and this is coming from um, ACOG Practice Bulletin and also the SGO recommendations, but when you perform a risk-reducing BSO, there's a number of factors. Number one, you want to perform a thorough evaluation of the abdominal cavity, so the upper abdomen, um, looking at the momentum, and then, of course, the 
pelvic organs as well. Two, you wanna obtain pelvic washings or cytology. Three, you want to remove at least two centimeters of the IP ligament to avoid the risk of uh, leaving an ovarian remnant. And as a trick, uh, sort of the jaw and mouth portion of the ligature, so the you know, the articulating portion is about two centimeters long. So you can use that as a quick sort of intra-op guide to be sure you're removing enough. Um, and then lastly, if a concurrent hysterectomy isn't also being performed at that time, the fallopian tube should be divided at its insertion into the uterine cornea. And I should also mention, um, there's a surgical video that I made that is available to the public and is linked both in the article, um, and it'll be online where you can see sort of a step-by-step -step of the procedure. Well, here's a screenshot to that video you made and we'll have a link for sure inside of the YouTube page. So just make sure to look down on the bottom to see the video. We just discussed a little bit about kind of the lack of efficacy when it comes to screening BRCA genetic mutation carriers with a CA125 and a transvaginal ultrasound for detecting cancer. But what about when they've made the decision for undergoing the risk-reducing BSO? What are some of the pros and cons? What is your clinical practice of getting one preoperatively to kind of stratify if one patient should really be taken back by a benign gynecologist versus if there's anything alarming and potentially should be stratified to see a gynecologic oncologist for the surgery? Right, exactly. It's a, it's a tough question. Um, and I don't think there is a right answer necessarily, but this definitely gets back to that debate about the efficacy of these tools. And, you know, yeah, so as I mentioned, they're not recommended for screening purposes, but the utility of obtaining, you know, one set, one CA25 and one pelvic ultrasound just before surgery, that's definitely less clear. It's a gray zone. Um, so in my study, we actually found that 48%, so almost half of all the patients had a CA125 collected. Um, of the ONC patients, 50% had them, and then of benign um, patients, 35% had one. So some of these were people who had already been getting this as part of ongoing screening, and then some were just obtained prior to surgery, but it wasn't easy to tell that from the chart, just being a retrospective um, study. That's one of the limitations, of course. Um, but obviously it's being done, right? And then regarding ultrasounds, again, just over half, so 53% had pre-op imaging performed, 56% of the onc patients and 43% of the benign. Um, so, you know, overall, I would say clearly it's being done. And if it's being done for provider preference or, or patient preference, you know, that's fine. But given the lack of the supportive data, the costs of obtaining these tests really outweigh their benefit in my mind. We've been discussing some of the results, but if we can talk about table two, can you discuss some more of the findings are and what are some of the patient characteristics that were associated with detection of malignancy at the time of risk reducing BSO? I'm glad you asked this question, Peter. Um, this is actually one of the shocking things that I learned from doing this study. Um, age. Age is the biggest factor um, in detecting malignancy at the time of risk reducing BSO. And what I found in my study is that the mean age of patients that were undergoing uh, surgery for BRCA1 was 46.1 years. And you'll remember, I just said that the recommended age range was between 35 and 40. And for BRCA2, the mean age of women having their surgery was 49.3 years, well out of that 40 to 45 range that they recommend. Um, so we all know that age is a strong risk factor and it is associated with detection of malignancy at the time of the risk reducing BSO. So why are these patients having this procedure performed so late? Why aren't they getting them at the recommended ages, right? So a few confounding factors that I thought that might play into this is the trend sort of toward later childbearing um, in this country in, you know, white females. Um, but then also maybe a late diagnosis of BRCA. Perhaps they didn't know that they had the diagnosis and then just had the surgery once they were diagnosed. Um, but either way, there's still room for improvement 100%. And then here's the other kicker. 
when you look at the patients who had surgery with onc versus benign, there was a significant difference in their age too. So the women who underwent surgery with benign were significantly older at 49.9 years versus 47.3 years for onc patients. So not only room for improvement overall, but certainly for those benign providers. And I think this is the biggest takeaway is that we need to be doing a thorough family histories to identify high-risk patients and diagnosing them as well as encouraging these patients to have the procedure performed at the appropriate ages. If you can talk about some of the findings in Table 3 and discuss kind of some of the different practices and adherence to the recommendations for risk-reducing BSO between the benign gynecologist and the oncologist. So we found that there was a significant difference in how many patients had washings performed. So 95% of the patients undergoing surgery with ONC had washings, but only 63% of those undergoing surgery with benign had washings, which um, you know is a shocking difference. The real question is, if there is a long-term impact on survival outcomes in these patients who were diagnosed with cancer but didn't have the washings performed. However, that was sort of outside of the scope of this study to examine, but is a good future question for research. Um, but then unfortunately, things like taking two centimeters of the IP ligament, performing a thorough cavity evaluation, you know, how, how close to the cornea did they take the tube? That just was difficult to assess given that it wasn't always documented in the op note. You know, we don't routinely dictate details like that sometimes. So I'll make a plug here for surgeons who are performing this procedure to actually dictate these factors for the future as they could be helpful. Um, in the paper, obviously you discussed that a total of eight patients uh, were ultimately diagnosed with malignancy, two of which who had visually apparent cancer at the time of their risk-reducing BSO. One of these patients had immediate ovarian cancer surgical staging, while the other patient had a delayed second staging procedure due to the unavailability of gynecologic oncology at the time of surgery, which was being initially performed by benign gynecologists. So it made me kind of think, what are your thoughts on universal frozen pathology during the time of these surgeries? as well as universal availability of a gynecologic oncologist if the surgery is being performed by a benign gynecologist. So the prevailing approach to the question of frozen is that it should not be performed. And my study and others have shown that the majority of these cancer diagnoses, as you just mentioned, are microscopic. And so they're being diagnosed after the procedure is performed, you know, several days after the patient has already completed the procedure. Um, and by its nature, these often won't be detected on frozen. Um, so what's important here, though, is that the past mesfins undergo this CFIM protocol, which I mentioned in my paper. This stands for sectioning and extensively examining the fimbriated end. Um, and this is a, a protocol where the pathologist basically amputate each fimbria at the infundibulum, then they take longitudinal sections of the fimbria and then extensively cross-section the remaining tube at two millimeter intervals. In contrast, classical sectioning would only um, include three representative sections from the entire adnexa. So obviously you're getting a lot deeper look into the adnexa using the CFIM protocol. And this drastically improves the detection of early tubal cancers and stick lesions. Um, in one paper, even up to 40% improved detection. And so it's important to specifically ask for this for patients with a BRCA mutation if it's not already routinely performed at your institution. And then, you know, as far as ONC backup, I think it's safe to say that it's always a good idea if it's available. Um, but if it's not, you know, if there are rural places where oncologists are hours away, uh, you know, I don't think it's a reason not to perform the procedure. The risk for the need for immediate conversion to staging is so low, as you mentioned, that I'd rather see these patients get their risk-reducing BSO at the age they need it than have it be delayed by something like oncology not being available for backup and then being sorry in the end. That makes sense. Well, thank you so much. Those are very thoughtful and insightful answers. I think this paper is very practical, and I can see this being discussed at journal clubs throughout the country because of its clinical utility. I want to thank you again for your time. Thank you so much, Peter. This is great. Well, I hope you have a great day. Thank you. You too.